The 1953 Iranian coup d'état, known in Iran as the 28 Mordad coup d'état Persian, Quite Murdad was the overthrow of the democratically elected Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh in favor of strengthening the monarchical rule of Mohammad Reza Pahlavi on 19 August 1953, orchestrated by the United Kingdom under the name Operation Boot and the United States under the name TPAJAX Project or Operation Ajax, and the first United States covert action to overthrow a foreign government during peacetime, Mossadegh had sought to audit the documents of the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company AIOC, a British corporation now part of BP and to limit the company's control over Iranian oil reserves. Upon the refusal of the AIOC to cooperate with the Iranian government, the parliament Majlis voted to nationalize Iran's oil industry and to expel foreign corporate representatives from the country. After this vote, Britain instigated a worldwide boycott of Iranian oil to pressure Iran economically. Initially, Britain mobilised its military to seize control of the British-built Abadan oil refinery, then the world's largest, but Prime Minister Clement Attlee opted instead to tighten the economic boycott while using Iranian agents to undermine Mossadegh's government. Judging Mossadegh to be unreliable and fearing a communist takeover in Iran, UK Prime Minister Winston Churchill and the Eisenhower administration decided to overthrow Iran's government, though the predecessor Truman administration had opposed a coup, fearing the precedent that Central Intelligence Agency CIA involvement would set. British intelligence officials' conclusions and the UK government's solicitations were instrumental in initiating and planning the coup, despite the fact that the US government in 1952 had been considering unilateral action without UK support to assist the Mossadegh government. Following the coup in 1953, a government under General Fazlallah Zahidi was formed which allowed Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the last Shah of Iran, Persian for an Iranian king, to rule more firmly as monarch. He relied heavily on United States support to hold on to power. According to the CIA's declassified documents and records, some of the most feared mobsters in Tehran were hired by the CIA to stage pro-Shah riots on 19 August. Other CIA paid men were brought into Tehran in buses and trucks, and took over the streets of the city. Between 200 and 300 people were killed because of the conflict. Mossadegh was arrested, tried and convicted of treason by the Shah's military court. On 21 December 1953, he was sentenced to three years in jail, then placed under house arrest for the remainder of his life. Other Mossadegh supporters were imprisoned, and several received the death penalty. After the coup, the Shah continued his rule as monarch for the next 26 years until he was overthrown in the Iranian Revolution in 1979. In August 2013, 60 years afterward, the U.S. government formally acknowledged the U.S. role in the coup by releasing a bulk of previously classified government documents that show it was in charge of both the planning and the execution of the coup, including the bribing of Iranian. Iranian politicians, security and army high-ranking officials, as well as pro-coup propaganda. The CIA is quoted acknowledging the coup was carried out under CIA direction and as an act of U.S. foreign policy, conceived and approved at the highest levels of government. Background Throughout the 19th century, Iran was caught between two advancing imperial powers, Russia and Britain. In 1892, the British diplomat George Curzon described Iran as 
pieces on a chessboard upon which is being played out a game for the dominion of the world. During the latter half of the 19th century, the concession policies of the monarchy faced increased opposition. In 1872, a representative of British entrepreneur Paul Reuter met with the Iranian monarch Nasser al-Din Shah Qajar and agreed to fund the monarch's upcoming lavish visit to Europe in return for exclusive contracts for Iranian roads, telegraphs, mills, factories, extraction of resources, and other public works, in which Reuter would receive stipulated sum for five years and 60% of all the net revenue for 20 years. However, the so-called Reuter concession was never put into effect because of violent opposition at home and from Russia. In 1892 the Shah was forced to revoke a tobacco monopoly given to Major G. F. Talbot, following protests and a widespread tobacco boycott. In 1901, Matsafar al-Din Shah Qajar, granted a 60-year petroleum search concession to William Knox Darcy. Darcy paid £20,000 equivalent to £2 million in 2016, according to journalist-turned-historian Stephen Kinzer, and promised equal ownership shares, with 16% of any future net profit, as calculated by the company. However, the historian L. P. Elwell Sutton wrote, in 1955, that Persia's share was hardly spectacular and no money changed hands. On 31 July 1907, Darcy withdrew from his private holdings in Persia, and transferred them to the British-owned Burma Oil Company. On 26 May 1908 the company struck oil at a depth of 1,180 feet 360 meters. The company grew slowly until World War I, when Persia's strategic importance led the British government to buy a controlling share in the company, essentially nationalising British oil production in Iran. The British angered the Persians by intervening in their domestic affairs, including in the Persian Constitutional Revolution. Massive popular protests had forced Matsafar al-Din Shah to allow for the Constitution of 1906, which limited his powers. It allowed for a democratically elected parliament majlis to make the laws, and a prime minister to sign and carry them out. The Prime Minister would be appointed by the Shah after a vote of confidence from Parliament. Nevertheless, the new constitution gave the Shah many executive powers as well. It allowed for the Shah to issue royal decrees Farman, gave him the power to appoint and dismiss Prime Ministers upon votes of confidence from Parliament, appoint half of the members of the Senate which was not convened until 1949, and introduce bills to and even dissolve Parliament. It abolished arbitrary rule, but the Shah served as an executive, rather than in a ceremonial role, consequently when a Shah was weak, the government was more democratic, but when the Shah acted on his own, the democratic aspects of the government could be sidelined. The contradictory aspects of this constitution would cause conflicts in the future. The Constitutional Revolution was opposed by the British and Russians, who attempted to subvert it through the backing of Muhammad Ali Shah Qajar the son of Matsafar e Din Shah, who tried to break up the democratic government by force. A guerrilla movement led by Sitar Khan deposed him in 1910. In the aftermath of World War I, there was widespread political dissatisfaction with the royalty terms of the British Petroleum Concession, under the Anglo Persian Oil Company, APOC, whereby Persia received 16% of net profits. In 1921, after years of severe mismanagement under the Qajar dynasty, a coup d'état allegedly backed by the British brought a general, Reza Khan, into the government. By 1923, he had become prime minister, and gained a reputation as an effective politician with a lack of corruption. 
By 1925 under his influence, Parliament voted to remove Ahmad Shah Qajar from the throne, and Reza Khan was crowned Reza Shah Pahlavi of the Pahlavi dynasty. Reza Shah began a rapid and successful modernization program in Persia, which up until that point had been considered to be among the most impoverished countries in the world. Nevertheless, Reza Shah was also a very harsh ruler who did not tolerate dissent. By the 1930s, he had suppressed all opposition, and had sidelined the democratic aspects of the constitution. Opponents were jailed and in some cases even executed. While some agreed with his policies, arguing that it was necessary as Iran was in such turmoil, others argued that it was unjustified. One such opponent was a politician named Mohammad Mossadegh, who was jailed in 1940. The experience gave him a lasting dislike for authoritarian rule and monarchy, and it helped make Mossadegh a dedicated advocate of complete oil nationalization in Iran. Reza Shah attempted to attenuate the power of the colonial forces in Iran, and was successful to a large extent. However, he also needed them to help modernize the country. He did so by balancing the influence of various colonial powers, including that of Britain and Germany. In the 1930s, Reza Shah tried to terminate the APOC concession that the Qajar dynasty had granted, but Iran was still weak and Britain would not allow it. The concession was renegotiated on terms again favorable to the British although the Darcy concession was softened. On 21 March 1935, Reza Shah changed the name of the country from Persia to Iran. The Anglo-Persian Oil Company was then renamed the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company AIOC. .In 1941, after the Nazi invasion of the USSR, the British and Commonwealth of Nations forces and the Red Army invaded Iran. Reza Shah had declared neutrality in World War II, and tried to balance between the two major powers, Britain and Nazi Germany. The primary reason for the invasion was in order to secure Iran's oil fields and the Trans-Iranian Railway in order to deliver supplies to the USSR. Reza Shah was arrested, deposed, and exiled by the British, and some other prominent officials were jailed as well. Reza Shah's 22-year-old son, Muhammad Reza Pahlavi, became the Shah of Iran. The new Shah, unlike his father, was initially a mild leader and at times indecisive. During the 1940s he did not for most part take an independent role in the government, and much of Reza Shah's authoritarian policies were rolled back. Iranian democracy effectively was restored during this period as a result, the British soldiers withdrew from Iran after the end of the war. However, under Stalin, the Soviet Union partly remained by sponsoring two people's democratic republics within Iran's borders. The related conflict was ended when the U.S. lobbied for the Iranian army to reassert control over the two occupied territories. The earlier agreed upon Soviet Iranian oil agreement would never be honored. Nationalist leaders in Iran became influential by seeking a reduction in long-term foreign interventions in their country, especially the oil concession which was very profitable for the West and not very profitable for Iran. The British-controlled AIOC refused to allow its books to be audited to determine whether the Iranian government was being paid what had been promised. British intransigence irked the Iranian population. U.S. Objectives in the Middle East remained the same between 1947 and 1952 but its strategy changed. Washington remained publicly in solidarity and privately at odds with Britain, its World War II ally. Britain's empire was steadily weakening, and with an eye on international crises, the U.S. reappraised its interests and the risks of being identified with British colonial interests. 
In Saudi Arabia, to Britain's extreme disapproval, Washington endorsed the arrangement between Aramco and Saudi Arabia in the 50-50 accord that had reverberations throughout the region. Iran's oil had been discovered and later controlled by the British-owned AIOC. Popular discontent with the AIOC began in the late 1940s. A large segment of Iran's public and a number of politicians saw the company as exploitative and a central tool of continued British imperialism in Iran. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Oil nationalization crisis. Assassination attempt on the Shah, and the appointment of Mossadegh as Prime Minister In 1949, an assassin attempted to kill the Shah. Shocked by the experience and emboldened by public sympathy for his injury, the Shah began to take an increasingly active role in politics. He quickly organized the Iran Constituent Assembly to amend the constitution to increase his powers. He established the Senate of Iran which had been a part of the constitution of 1906 but had never been convened. The Shah had the right to appoint half the senators and he chose men sympathetic to his aims. Mossadegh thought this increase in the Shah's political power was not democratic, he believed that the Shah should reign, but not rule, in a manner similar to Europe's constitutional monarchies. Led by Mossadegh, political parties and opponents of the Shah's policies banded together to form a coalition known as the National Front. Oil nationalization was a major policy goal for the party. By 1951, the National Front had won majority seats for the popularly elected Majlis Parliament of Iran. According to Iran's constitution, the majority elected party in the parliament would give a vote of confidence for its prime minister candidate, after which the Shah would appoint the candidate to power. The Prime Minister Haj Ali Razmara, who opposed the oil nationalization on technical grounds, was assassinated by the hardline Fadayan e Islam, whose spiritual leader the Ayatollah Abol Qasim Kashani, a mentor to the future Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini, had been appointed Speaker of the Parliament by the National Front. After a vote of confidence from the National Front dominated parliament, Mossadegh was appointed Prime Minister of Iran by the Shah, replacing Hossein Allah, who had replaced Razmara. Under heavy pressure by the National Front, the assassin of Razmara, Khalil Tomasebi, was released and pardoned, thus proving the movement's power in Iranian politics. For the time being, Mossadegh and Kashani were allies of convenience, as Mossadegh saw that Kashani could mobilize the religious masses, while Kashani wanted Mossadegh to create an Islamic state. Kashani's Fadayan mobs often violently attacked the opponents of nationalization and opponents of the National Front government, as well as immoral objects, acting at times as unofficial enforcers for the movement. However, by 1953 Mossadegh was becoming increasingly opposed to Kashani, as the latter was contributing to mass political instability in Iran. Kashani in turn, berated Mossadegh for not Islamizing Iran, as the latter was a firm believer in the separation of religion and state, the Shah and his prime minister had an antagonistic relationship. Part of the problem stemmed from the fact that Mossadegh was connected by blood to the former royal Qajar dynasty, and saw the Pahlavi king as a usurper to the throne. But the real issue stemmed from the fact that Mossadegh represented a pro-democratic force that wanted to temper the Shah's rule in Iranian politics. He wanted the Shah to be a ceremonial monarch rather than a ruling monarch, thus giving the elected government power over the unelected Shah. 
While the constitution of Iran gave the Shah the power to rule directly, Mossadegh used the United National Front bloc and the widespread popular support for the oil nationalization vote, the latter which the Shah supported as well, in order to block the Shah's ability to act. As a result, the oil nationalization issue became increasingly intertwined with the Mossadegh's pro-democracy movement. The dejected Shah was angered by Mossadegh's insolence. According to Abbas Milani, he angrily paced in the rooms of his palace at the thought that he would be reduced to a figurehead. But Mossadegh and the oil nationalization's popularity prevented the Shah from acting against his prime minister, which was allowed under Iran's constitution, something that Mossadegh felt a king had no right to do. In 1952 the Shah dismissed Mossadegh, replacing him with Ahmad Kavim, a veteran prime minister. But widespread protests by Mossadegh supporters resulted in the Shah immediately reinstating him. <inaudible> <inaudible> Oil nationalization, the Abadan crisis, and rising tensions In late 1951, Iran's parliament in a near-unanimous vote approved the oil nationalization agreement. The bill was widely popular among most Iranians, and generated a huge wave of nationalism, and immediately put Iran at loggerheads with Britain the handful of MPs that disagreed with it voted for it as well in the face of overwhelming popular support, and the Fidayans' wrath. The nationalization made Mossadegh instantly popular among millions of Iranians, cementing him as a national hero, and placing him and Iran at the center of worldwide attention. Many Iranians felt that for the first time in centuries, they were taking control of the affairs of their country. Many also expected that nationalization would result in a massive increase of wealth for Iranians. Britain now faced the newly elected nationalist government in Iran where Mossadegh, with strong backing of the Iranian parliament and people, demanded more favorable concessionary arrangements, which Britain vigorously opposed. The U.S. State Department not only rejected Britain's demand that it continue to be the primary beneficiary of Iranian oil reserves but U.S. international oil interests were among the beneficiaries of the concessionary arrangements that followed nationalization. Mohammad Mossadegh attempted to negotiate with the AIOC, but the company rejected his proposed compromise. Mossadegh's plan, based on the 1948 compromise between the Venezuelan government of Romulo Gallegos and Creole Petroleum, would divide the profits from oil 50-50 between Iran and Britain. Against the recommendation of the United States, Britain refused this proposal and began planning to undermine and overthrow the Iranian government. In July 1951, the American diplomat Averill Harriman went to Iran to negotiate an Anglo Iranian compromise, asking the Shah's help. His reply was that. In the face of public opinion, there was no way he could say a word against nationalization. Harriman held a press conference in Tehran, calling for reason and enthusiasm in confronting the nationalization crisis. As soon as he spoke, a journalist rose and shouted, We and the Iranian people all support Premier Mossadegh and oil nationalization. Everyone present began cheering and then marched out of the room. The abandoned Harriman shook his head in dismay. On a visit to the United States in October 1951, Mossadegh in spite of the popularity of nationalization in Iran agreed in talks with George C. McGee to a complex settlement of the crisis involving the sale of the Abadan refinery to a non-British company and Iranian control of the extraction of crude oil. 
The U.S. waited until Winston Churchill became Prime Minister to present the deal, believing he would be more flexible, but the deal was rejected by the British. The National Iranian Oil Company suffered decreased production, because of Iranian inexperience and the AIOC's orders that British technicians not work with them, thus provoking the Abadan crisis that was aggravated by the Royal Navy's blockading its export markets to pressure Iran to not nationalize its petroleum. The Iranian revenues were greater, because the profits went to Iran's national treasury rather than to private, foreign oil companies. By September 1951, the British had virtually ceased Abadan oil field production, forbidden British export to Iran of key British commodities including sugar and steel, and had frozen Iran's hard currency accounts in British banks. British Prime Minister Clement Attlee considered seizing the Abadan oil refinery by force, but instead settled on an embargo by the Royal Navy, stopping any ship transporting Iranian oil for carrying so-called stolen property. On his re-election as Prime Minister, Winston Churchill took an even harder stance against Iran. The United Kingdom took its anti-nationalization case against Iran to the International Court of Justice at The Hague. PM Mossadegh said the world would learn of a cruel and imperialistic country stealing from a needy and naked people. Quote dot. The court ruled that it had no jurisdiction over the case. Nevertheless, the British continued to enforce the embargo of Iranian oil. In August 1952, Iranian Prime Minister Mossadegh invited an American oil executive to visit Iran and the Truman administration welcomed the invitation. However, the suggestion upset Churchill who insisted that the U.S. not undermine his campaign to isolate Mossadegh. Britain was supporting the Americans in Korea, he reminded Truman, and had a right to expect Anglo-American unity on Iran. In mid-1952, Britain's embargo of Iranian oil was devastatingly effective. British agents in Tehran worked to subvert the government of Mossadegh, who sought help from President Truman and then the World Bank but to no avail. Quote, Iranians were becoming poorer and unhappier by the day, and Mossadegh's political coalition was fraying. To make matters worse, the Speaker of the Parliament Ayatollah Kashani, Mossadegh's main clerical supporter, became increasingly opposed to the Prime Minister, because Mossadegh was not turning Iran into an Islamic state. By 1953, he had completely turned on him, and supported the coup, depriving Mossadegh of religious support, while giving it to the Shah. In the Majlis election in the spring of 1952, Mossadegh had little to fear from a free vote, since despite the country's problems, he was widely admired as a hero. A free vote, however, was not what others were planning. British agents had fanned out across the country, bribing candidates, and the regional bosses who controlled them. They hoped to fill the majlis with deputies who would vote to depose Mossadegh. It would be a coup carried out by seemingly legal means, while the National Front, which often supported Mossadegh won handily in the big cities, there was no one to monitor voting in the rural areas. Violence broke out in Abadan and other parts of the country where elections were hotly contested. Faced with having to leave Iran for The Hague where Britain was suing for control of Iranian oil, Mossadegh's cabinet voted to postpone the remainder of the election until after the return of the Iranian delegation from The Hague. While Mossadegh dealt with political challenge, he faced another that most Iranians considered far more urgent. The British blockade of Iranian seaports meant that Iran was left without access to markets where it could sell its oil. 
The embargo had the effect of causing Iran to spiral into bankruptcy. Tens of thousands had lost their jobs at the Abadan refinery, and although most understood and passionately supported the idea of nationalization, they naturally hoped that Mossadegh would find a way to put them back to work. The only way he could do that was to sell oil. To make matters worse, the Communist Two-Day Party, which supported the Soviet Union and had attempted to kill the Shah only four years earlier, began to infiltrate the military and send mobs to support Mossadegh, but in reality to marginalize all non-communist opponents. Earlier, the Two-Day had denounced Mossadegh, but by 1953 they changed tack and decided to support him. The Tuday violently attacked opponents under the guise of helping the Prime Minister, the cousin of the future Queen of Iran, Farah Pahlavi, was stabbed at the age of 13 in his school by Tuday activists, and unwittingly helped cause Mossadegh's reputation to decline, despite the fact that he never officially endorsed them. However, by 1953 he and the Tuday had formed an unofficial alliance of convenience with each other. The Tuday were the foot soldiers for his government, effectively replacing the Fadayan in that role, all the while secretly hoping that Mossadegh would institute communism. Pro-Shah mobs also carried out attacks on Mossadegh opponents, and there may have been some CIA coordination, worried about Britain's other interests in Iran, and, thanks to the Tuday party, believing that Iran's nationalism was really a Soviet-backed plot, Britain persuaded U.S. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles that Iran was falling to the Soviets—effectively exploiting the American Cold War mindset. Since President Harry S. Truman was busy fighting a war in Korea, he did not agree to overthrow the government of Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh. However, in 1953, when Dwight D. Eisenhower became president, the UK convinced the US to undertake a joint coup d'état. Topic: <laughs> Final months of Mossadegh's government. By 1953, economic tensions caused by the British embargo and political turmoil began to take a major toll upon Mossadegh's popularity and political power. The people were increasingly blaming him for the economic and political crisis. Political violence was becoming widespread in the form of street clashes between rival political groups. Mossadegh was losing popularity and support among the working class which had been his strongest supporters. As he lost support, he became more autocratic. As early as August 1952, he began to rely on emergency powers to rule, generating controversy among his supporters. After an assassination attempt upon one of his cabinet ministers and himself, he ordered the jailing of dozens of his political opponents. This act created widespread anger among much of the general public, and led to accusations that Mossadegh was becoming a dictator. The Tuday Party's unofficial alliance with Mossadegh led to fears of communism, and increasingly it was the communists who were taking part in pro Mossadegh rallies and attacking opponents. By mid 1953, a mass of resignations by Mossadegh's parliamentary supporters reduced the National Front seats in Parliament. A referendum to dissolve Parliament and give the Prime Minister power to make law was submitted to voters, and it passed with 99.9% .9 approval, 2,043,300 votes to 1,300 votes against. The rigged referendum was widely seen by opponents as a dictatorial act, and the Shah and the rest of the government were effectively stripped of their powers to rule. When Mossadegh dissolved the parliament, his opponents decried this act because he had effectively given himself total power. 
Ironically, this undemocratic act by a democratically elected prime minister would result in a chain of events leading to his downfall. The Shah himself initially opposed the coup plans and supported the oil nationalization, but he joined after being informed by the CIA that he too would be deposed. If he didn't play along, the experience left him with a lifelong awe of American power, and would contribute to his pro-U.S. policies, while generating a hatred of the British. Mossadegh's decision to dissolve Parliament also contributed to his decision. <laughs> <laughs> Execution of Operation Ajax The official pretext for the start of the coup was Mossadegh's decree to dissolve parliament, giving himself and his cabinet complete power to rule, while effectively stripping the Shah of his powers. It resulted in him being accused of giving himself total and dictatorial powers. The Shah, who had been resisting the CIA's demands for the coup, finally agreed to support it. Having obtained the Shah's concurrence, the CIA executed the coup. Furman's royal decrees dismissing Mossadegh and appointing General Fazlala Zahidi, a loyalist who had helped Reza Shah reunify Iran decades earlier, were drawn up by the coup plotters and signed by the Shah. Having signed the decrees and delivered them to General Zahidi, he and Queen Saraya departed for a week-long vacation in northern Iran. On Saturday 15 August, Colonel Nematala Nasiri, the commander of the Imperial Guard, delivered to Mossadegh a firman from the Shah dismissing him. Mossadegh, who had been warned of the plot, probably by the Communist Two-Day Party, rejected the firman and had Nasiri arrested. Mossadegh argued at his trial after the coup that under the Iranian constitutional monarchy, the Shah had no constitutional right to issue an order for the elected prime minister's dismissal without parliament's consent. However, the constitution at the time did allow for such an action, which Mossadegh considered unfair. The action was publicized within Iran by the CIA and in the United States by the New York Times. Mossadegh's supporters millions of National Front supporters as well as members of the Two-Day Party took to the streets in violent protests. Following the failed coup attempt, the Shah, accompanied by his second wife Saraya Esfandiari Bakhtiari and Abul Fath Atabe fled to Baghdad. Arriving unannounced, the Shah asked for permission for himself and his consort to stay in Baghdad for a few days before continuing on to Europe. After high-level government consultations, they were escorted to the White House, the Iraqi government's guest house, before flying to Italy in a plane flown by Mohammad Amir Khatami. After the first coup attempt failed, General Zahidi, declaring that he was the rightful Prime Minister of Iran, shuttled between multiple safe houses attempting to avoid arrest. Mossadegh ordered security forces to round up the coup plotters, and dozens were imprisoned. Believing that he had succeeded, and that he was in full control of the government, Mossadegh erred. Assuming that the coup had failed, he asked his supporters to return to their homes and to continue with their lives as normal. The two-day party members also returned to their homes, no longer carrying out enforcement duties. The CIA was ordered to leave Iran, although Kermit Roosevelt Jr. was slow to receive the message—allegedly due to MI6 interference—and eagerly continued to foment anti-Mossadegh unrest. The Eisenhower administration considered changing its policy to support Mossadegh, with Undersecretary of State Walter Bedell Smith remarking on August 17. Whatever his faults, Mossadegh had no love for the Russians and timely aid might enable him to keep communism in check. However, General Zahidi, who was still on the run, met with the pro-Shah Ayatollah Muhammad Bebahani and other Shah supporters in secret. 
there using CIA money deridingly known as Bebahani dollars. They quickly created a new plan. Already, much of the country was in shock from the Shah's flight from Iran, fears of communism, and Mossadegh's arrests of opponents. They capitalized on this sentiment in their plans. The Ayatollah Bebahani also used his influence to rally religious demonstrators against Mossadegh. On 19 August, hired infiltrators posing as two-day party members began to organize a communist revolution. They came and encouraged real two-day members to join in. Soon, the two-day members took to the streets attacking virtually any symbols of capitalism, and looting private businesses and destroying shops. Much of southern Tehran's business district, including the bazaars, were vandalized. With sudden mass public revulsion against this act, the next part of Zahidi's plan came into action. From the vandalized bazaars, a second group of paid infiltrators, this time posing as Shah supporters, organized angry crowds of common Iranians who were terrified about a communist revolution. And sickened by the violence, by the middle of the day, large crowds of regular citizens, armed with improvised weapons, took to the streets in mass demonstrations, and beat back the two-day party members. Under Zahidi's authority, the army left its barracks and drove off the communist two-day and then stormed all government buildings with the support of demonstrators. Mossadegh fled after a tank fired a single shell into his house, but he later turned himself in to the army's custody. To prevent further bloodshed, he refused a last attempt to organize his supporters. By the end of the day, Zahidi and the army were in control of the government. Despite the CIA's role in creating the conditions for the coup, there is little evidence to suggest that Kermit Roosevelt Jr. or other CIA officials were directly responsible for the actions of the demonstrators or the army on August 19. It has even been suggested that Roosevelt's activities between August 15-19 were primarily intended to organize. Stay behind networks as part of the planned CIA evacuation of the country. Although they allowed him to later claim responsibility for the day's outcome, the Shah stayed in a hotel in Italy until he learned what had transpired, upon which he chokingly declared, I knew they loved me. Alan Dulles, the director of the CIA, flew back with the Shah from Rome to Tehran. Zahidi officially replaced Mossadegh. Mossadegh was arrested, tried, and originally sentenced to death. But on the Shah's personal orders, his sentence was commuted to three years' solitary confinement in a military prison, followed by house arrest until his death. Topic. United States' role As a condition for restoring the Anglo-Iranian oil company, in 1954 the U.S. required removal of the AIOC's monopoly, five American petroleum companies, Royal Dutch Shell, and the company Française des Petroles, were to draw Iran's petroleum after the successful coup d'état. Operation Ajax. The Shah declared this to be a victory for Iranians, with the massive influx of money from this agreement resolving the economic collapse from the last three years, and allowing him to carry out his planned modernization projects. As part of that, the CIA organized anti communist guerrillas to fight the two day party if they seized power in the chaos of Operation Ajax. Released National Security Archive documents showed that Under Secretary of State Walter Bedell Smith reported that the CIA had agreed with Kashke tribal leaders, in South Iran, to establish a clandestine safe haven from which U.S. funded guerrillas and spies could operate. Operation Ajax's formal leader was senior CIA officer Kermit Roosevelt, Jr., while career agent Donald Wilbur was the operational 
leader, planner, and executor of the deposition of Mossadegh. The coup d'état depended on the impotent shahs dismissing the popular and powerful prime minister and replacing him with General Fazlallah Zahidi, with help from Colonel Abbas Farzanagan, a man agreed upon by the British and Americans after determining his anti-Soviet politics. The CIA sent Major General Norman Schwarzkopf Sr. to persuade the exiled shah to return to rule Iran. Schwarzkopf trained the security forces that would become known as SAVAK to secure the Shah's hold on power. The coup was carried out by the U.S. administration of Dwight D. Eisenhower in a covert action advocated by Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, and implemented under the supervision of his brother Alan Dulles, the Director of Central Intelligence. The coup was organized by the United States CIA and the United Kingdom's MI6, two spy agencies that aided royalists and royalist elements of the Iranian army. Much of the money was channeled through the pro-Shah Ayatollah Muhammad Bebahani, who drew many religious masses to the plot. Ayatollah Kashani had completely turned on Mossadegh and supported the Shah. By this point, according to a heavily redacted CIA document released to the National Security Archive in response to a Freedom of Information request, available documents do not indicate who authorized CIA to begin planning the operation, but it almost certainly was President Eisenhower himself. Eisenhower biographer Stephen Ambrose has written that the absence of documentation reflected the president's style. The CIA document then quotes from the Ambrose biography of Eisenhower, before going into the operation, Ajax had to have the approval of the president. Eisenhower participated in none of the meetings that set up Ajax, he received only oral reports on the plan, and he did not discuss it with his cabinet or the NSC. Establishing a pattern he would hold to throughout his presidency, he kept his distance and left no documents behind that could implicate the president in any projected coup. But in the privacy of the Oval Office, over cocktails, he was kept informed by Foster Dulles, and he maintained a tight control over the activities of the CIA. CIA officer Kermit Roosevelt Jr., the grandson of former President Theodore Roosevelt, carried out the operation planned by CIA agent Donald Wilbur. One version of the CIA history, written by Wilbur, referred to the operation as TPAJAX. During the coup, Roosevelt and Wilbur, representatives of the Eisenhower administration, bribed Iranian government officials, reporters, and businessmen. They also bribed street thugs to support the Shah and oppose Mossadegh. The deposed Iranian leader, Mossadegh, was taken to jail and Iranian general Fazlallah Zahidi named himself prime minister in the new, pro-Western government. Another tactic Roosevelt admitted to using was bribing demonstrators into attacking symbols of the Shah, while chanting pro-Mossadegh slogans. As king, the Shah was largely seen as a symbol of Iran at the time by many Iranians and monarchists. Roosevelt declared that the more that these agents showed their hate for the Shah and attacked his symbols, the more it caused the average Iranian citizen to dislike and distrust Mossadegh. The British and American spy agencies strengthened the monarchy to Iran by backing the pro-Western Shah for the next 26 years. The Shah was overthrown in 1979. The overthrow of Iran's elected government in 1953 ensured Western control of Iran's petroleum resources and prevented the Soviet Union from competing for Iranian oil. Some Iranian clerics cooperated with the Western spy agencies because they were dissatisfied with Mossadegh's secular government. While the broad outlines of the operation are known.
The CIA's records were widely thought by historians to have the potential to add depth and clarity to a famous but little documented intelligence operation. Reporter Tim Weiner wrote in the New York Times, the 29th of May 1997. The Central Intelligence Agency, which has repeatedly pledged for more than five years to make public the files from its secret mission to overthrow the government of Iran in 1953, said today that it had destroyed or lost almost all the documents decades ago. A historian who was a member of the CIA staff in 1992 and 1993 said in an interview today that the records were obliterated by a culture of destruction at the agency. The historian, Nick Cullither, said he believed that records on other major Cold War covert operations had been burned, including those on secret missions in Indonesia in the 1950s and a successful CIA-sponsored coup in Guyana in the early 1960s. Iran. There's nothing. Mr. Cullither said. Indonesia. Very little. Guyana. That was burned. Donald Wilbur, one of the CIA officers who planned the 1953 coup in Iran, wrote an account titled, Clandestine Service History Overthrow of Premier Mossadegh of Iran, November 1952 to August 1953. Wilbur said one goal of the coup was to strengthen the Shah. In 2000, James Risen at the New York Times obtained the previously secret CIA version of the coup written by Wilbur and summarized its contents, which includes the following. In early August, the CIA stepped up the pressure. Iranian operatives pretending to be communists threatened Muslim leaders with savage punishment if they opposed Mossadegh seeking to stir anti-communist sentiment in the religious community. In addition, the secret history says, the house of at least one prominent Muslim was bombed by CIA agents posing as communists. It does not say whether anyone was hurt in this attack. The agency was also intensifying its propaganda campaign. A leading newspaper owner was granted a personal loan of about $45,000, in the belief that this would make his organ amenable to our purposes. But the Shah remained intransigent. In a 1 August meeting with General Norman Schwarzkopf, he refused to sign the CIA written decrees firing Mr. Mossadegh and appointing General Zahidi. He said he doubted that the army would support him in a showdown. The National Security Archive at George Washington University contains the full account by Wilbur, along with many other coup related documents and analysis. In a January 1973 telephone conversation made public in 2009, U.S. President Richard Nixon told CIA Director Richard Helms, who was awaiting Senate confirmation to become the new U.S. ambassador to Iran, that Nixon wanted Helms to be a regional ambassador to Persian Gulf oil states, and noted that Helms had been a schoolmate of Shah Reza Pahlavi. Topic. Release of U.S. government records and official acknowledgement In August 2013, on the 60th anniversary of the coup, the U.S. government released documents showing they were involved in staging the coup. The documents also describe the motivations behind the coup and the strategies used to stage it. The UK had sought to censor information regarding its role in the coup. A significant number of documents about the coup still remained classified. 
The release of the declassified documents, which marked the first U.S. official acknowledgement of its role, was seen as a goodwill gesture on the part of the Obama administration. In June 2017, the United States State Department's Office of the Historian released its revised historical account of the event. The volume of historical records focuses on the evolution of U.S. thinking on Iran as well as the U.S. government covert operation that resulted in Mossadegh's overthrow on August 19, 1953. Though some of the relevant records were destroyed long ago, the release contains a collection of roughly 1,000 pages, only a small number of which remain classified. One revelation is that the CIA attempted to call off the failing coup but was salvaged by an insubordinate spy. In March 2018, the National Security Archive released an additional document, a declassified British memo, alleging that the United States Embassy sent large sums of money to influential people namely senior Iranian clerics—in the days leading up to Mossadegh's overthrow. <inaudible> <inaudible> United States financial support The CIA paid a large sum to carry out the operation. Depending on the expenses to be counted, the final cost is estimated to vary from $100,000 to $20 million. CIA gave Zahidi's government $5 million after the coup with Zahidi himself receiving an extra million. <laughs> United States motives Historians disagree on what motivated the United States to change its policy towards Iran and stage the coup. Middle East historian Irvand Abrahamian identified the coup d'état as a classic case of nationalism clashing with imperialism in the Third World. He states that Secretary of State Dean Acheson admitted the communist threat was a smokescreen. In responding to President Eisenhower's claim that the two-day party was about to assume power. Throughout the crisis, the communist danger was more of a rhetorical device than a real issue, i.e. it was part of the Cold War discourse. The two-day was no match for the armed tribes and the 129,000-man military. What is more, the British and Americans had enough inside information to be confident that the party had no plans to initiate armed insurrection. At the beginning of the crisis, when the Truman administration was under the impression a compromise was possible, Acheson had stressed the communist danger, and warned if Mossadegh was not helped, the two-day would take over. The British Foreign Office had retorted that the two-day was no real threat. But, in August 1953, when the Foreign Office echoed the Eisenhower administration's claim that the two-day was about to take over, Acheson now retorted that there was no such communist danger. Acheson was honest enough to admit that the issue of the two-day was a smokescreen. Abrahamian states that Iran's oil was the central focus of the coup, for both the British and the Americans, though, much of the discourse at the time linked it to the Cold War. Abrahamian wrote, If Mossadegh had succeeded in nationalizing the British oil industry in Iran, that would have set an example and was seen at that time by the Americans as a threat to U.S. oil interests throughout the world, because other countries would do the same. Mossadegh did not want any compromise solution that allowed a degree of foreign control. Abrahamian said that Mossadegh wanted real nationalization, both in theory and practice. 
Terman points out that agricultural landowners were politically dominant in Iran, well into the 1960s and the monarch, Reza Shah's aggressive land expropriation policies—to the benefit of himself and his supporters—resulted in the Iranian government being Iran's largest landowner. The landlords and oil producers had new backing, moreover, as American interests were for the first time exerted in Iran. The Cold War was starting, and Soviet challenges were seen in every leftist movement. But the reformers were at root nationalists, not communists, and the issue that galvanized them above all others was the control of oil. The belief that oil was the central motivator behind the coup has been echoed in the popular media by authors such as Robert Byrd, Alan Greenspan, and Ted Koppel. However, Middle East political scientist Mark Gasiorowski states that while, on the face of it, there is considerable merit to the argument that U.S. policymakers helped U.S. oil companies gain a share in Iranian oil production after the coup. It seems more plausible to argue that U.S. policymakers were motivated mainly by fears of a communist takeover in Iran, and that the involvement of U.S. companies was sought mainly to prevent this from occurring. The Cold War was at its height in the early 1950s, and the Soviet Union was viewed as an expansionist power seeking world domination. Eisenhower had made the Soviet threat a key issue in the 1952 elections, accusing the Democrats of being soft on communism and of having lost China. Once in power, the new administration quickly sought to put its views into practice. Gasiorowski further states the major U.S. oil companies were not interested in Iran at this time. A glut existed in the world oil market. The U.S. majors had increased their production in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait in 1951 in order to make up for the loss of Iranian production. Operating in Iran would force them to cut back production in these countries which would create tensions with Saudi and Kuwaiti leaders. Furthermore, if nationalist sentiments remained high in Iran, production there would be risky. U.S. oil companies had shown no interest in Iran in 1951 and 1952. By late 1952, the Truman administration had come to believe that participation by U.S. companies in the production of Iranian oil was essential to maintain stability in Iran and keep Iran out of Soviet hands. In order to gain the participation of the major U.S. oil companies, Truman offered to scale back a large antitrust case then being brought against them. The Eisenhower administration shared Truman's views on the participation of U.S. companies in Iran and also agreed to scale back the antitrust case. Thus, not only did U.S. majors not want to participate in Iran at this time, it took a major effort by U.S. policymakers to persuade them to become involved. In 2004, Gasiorowski edited a book on the coup arguing that the climate of intense Cold War rivalry between the superpowers, together with Iran's strategic vital location between the Soviet Union and the Persian Gulf oil fields, led U.S. officials to believe that they had to take whatever steps were necessary to prevent Iran from falling into Soviet hands. While these concerns seem vastly overblown today, the pattern of the 1945-46 Azerbaijan crisis, the consolidation of Soviet control in Eastern Europe, the communist triumph in China, and the Korean War—and with the Red Scare at its height in the United States—would not allow U.S. officials to risk allowing the two-day party to gain power in Iran. Furthermore, U.S. officials believed that resolving the oil dispute was essential for restoring stability in Iran, and after March 1953 it appeared that the dispute could be resolved only at the expense either of Britain or of Mossadegh. He concludes, 
It was geostrategic considerations, rather than a desire to destroy Mossadegh's movement, to establish a dictatorship in Iran or to gain control over Iran's oil, that persuaded U.S. officials to undertake the coup. Faced with choosing between British interests and Iran, the U.S. chose Britain, Gasiorovsky said. Britain was the closest ally of the United States, and the two countries were working as partners on a wide range of vitally important matters throughout the world at this time. Preserving this close relationship was more important to U.S. officials than saving Mossadegh's tottering regime. A year earlier, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill used Britain's support for the U.S. in the Cold War to insist the United States not undermine his campaign to isolate Mossadegh. Britain was supporting the Americans in Korea, he reminded Truman, and had a right to expect Anglo-American unity on Iran. The two main winners of World War II, who had been allies during the war, became superpowers and competitors as soon as the war ended, each with their own spheres of influence and client states. After the 1953 coup, Iran became one of the client states of the United States. In his earlier book, U.S. Foreign Policy and the Shah, Building a Client State in Iran, Gasiorovsky identifies the client states of the United States and of the Soviet Union during 1954–1977. Gasiorovsky identified Cambodia, Guatemala, Indonesia, Iran, Laos, Nicaragua, Panama, the Philippines, South Korea, South Vietnam, and Taiwan as strong client states of the United States and identified those that were moderately important to the U.S. as Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, El Salvador, Greece, Haiti, Honduras, Israel, Jordan, Liberia, Pakistan, Paraguay, Thailand, Tunisia, Turkey, and Zaire. He named Argentina, Chile, Ethiopia, Japan, and Peru as weak client states of the United States. Gasiorovsky identified Bulgaria, Cuba, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, Mongolia, Poland, North Vietnam, and Romania as strong client states of the Soviet Union, and Afghanistan, Egypt, Guinea, North Korea, Somalia, and Syria as moderately important client states. Mali and South Yemen were classified as weak client states of the Soviet Union. According to Kinzer, for most Americans, the crisis in Iran became just part of the conflict between communism and the free world. A great sense of fear, particularly the fear of encirclement, shaped American consciousness during this period. Soviet power had already subdued Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Communist governments were imposed on Bulgaria and Romania in 1946, Hungary and Poland in 1947, and Czechoslovakia in 1948. Albania and Yugoslavia also turned to communism. Greek communists made a violent bid for power. Soviet soldiers blocked land routes to Berlin for 16 months. In 1949, the Soviet Union successfully tested a nuclear weapon. That same year, pro-Western forces in China lost their civil war to communists led by Mao Zedong. From Washington, it seemed that enemies were on the march everywhere. Consequently. The United States, challenged by what most Americans saw as a relentless communist advance, slowly ceased to view Iran as a country with a unique history that faced a unique political challenge. Some historians, including Douglas Little, Abbas Milani and George Lenchowski have echoed the view that fears of a communist takeover or Soviet influence motivated the U.S. to intervene. 
On the 11th of May 1951, prior to the overthrow of Mossadegh, Adolf A. Burrell warned the U.S. State Department that U.S. control of the Middle East was at stake, which, with its Persian Gulf oil, meant substantial control of the world. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> News coverage in the United States and Great Britain. When Mossadegh called for the dissolution of the Majlis in August 1953, the editors of the New York Times gave the opinion that, "...a plebiscite more fantastic and farcical than any ever held under Hitler or Stalin is now being staged in Iran by Premier Mossadegh in an effort to make himself unchallenged dictator of the country." A year after the coup, the New York Times wrote on 6 August 1954, that a new oil agreement between Iran and a consortium of foreign oil companies was good news indeed. Costly as the dispute over Iranian oil has been to all concerned, the affair may yet be proved worthwhile if lessons are learned from it. Underdeveloped countries with rich resources now have an object lesson in the heavy cost that must be paid by one of their number which goes berserk with fanatical nationalism. It is perhaps too much to hope that Iran's experience will prevent the rise of Mossadegh's in other countries, but that experience may at least strengthen the hands of more reasonable and more far-seeing leaders. In some circles in Great Britain the charge will be pushed that American imperialism in the shape of the American oil firms in the consortium has once again elbowed Britain from a historic stronghold. The British government used the BBC's Persian service for advancing its propaganda against Mossadegh. Anti-Mossadegh material were repeatedly aired on the radio channel to the extent that Iranian staff at the BBC Persian radio went on strike to protest the move. The documentary Cinematograph aired on 18 August 2011 on the anniversary of the coup. In it, BBC admitted for the first time to the role of BBC Persian Radio as the propaganda arm of the British government in Iran. The cinematograph narrator said, The British government used the BBC Persian Radio for advancing its propaganda against Mossadegh and anti-Mossadegh material were repeatedly aired on the radio channel to the extent that Iranian staff at the BBC Persian Radio went on strike to protest the move. The documentary quoted a 21 July 1951 classified document in which a foreign office official thanked the British ambassador for his proposals that were precisely followed by the BBC Persian Radio to strengthen its propaganda against Mossadegh. The BBC had already made most of the points which you listed, but they were very glad to have an indication from you of what was likely to be most effective and will arrange their program accordingly. We should also avoid direct attacks on the ruling classes since it seems probable that we may want to deal with a government drawn from those classes should Mossadegh fall. The document further stressed that the Foreign Office shall be grateful for the ambassador's comments on the propaganda line we have proposed." An early account of the CIA's role in the coup appeared in the Saturday Evening Post in late 1954, purporting to explain how the strategic little nation of Iran was rescued from the closing clutch of Moscow. The report was approved by the CIA, and its authors may have been assisted by Kermit Roosevelt Jr., who had written for the Post before. Topic: <laughs> Britain's role. Despite the British government's pressure, the National Security Archive released two declassified documents in August 2017 which confirm the British solicitation of the United States assistance in ousting Mossadegh. 
According to these records, the British first approached the American government about a plan for the coup in November 1952, repeatedly asking U.S. to join the coup, claiming that the Mossadegh government would be ineffective in preventing a communist takeover, and that Mossadegh was a threat to America's global fight against communism, which they believed necessitated action. The records also state that U.K. and U.S. spy agencies had by then had very tentative and preliminary discussions regarding the practicability of such a move. At the time, the American government was already preparing to aid Mossadegh in his oil dealings with the British, and believed him to be anti-communist—considerations which made the U.S. government skeptical of the plot. Since President Truman's term was drawing to a close in January 1953, and there was too much uncertainty and danger associated with the plot, the U.S. government decided not to take action against Mossadegh at the time. According to the 1952 documents, it was Christopher Steele, the number two official in the British Embassy in Washington, who pitched the idea of the coup to U.S. officials amid the U.S.-Britain talks which had began in October. The document also says that the British officials rejected Paul Nitze's suggestion that, instead of executing a coup, they mount a campaign against Ayatollah Abulkasim Kashani, a leading opponent of British involvement in Iran's oil industry, and the Communist Two-Day Party. They pressed U.S. for a decision. Since the new, the Truman administration was in its final weeks. According to Wilbur, the British Secret Intelligence Service worked with CIA to form a propaganda campaign via the press, handbills and the Tehran clergy to weaken the Mossadegh government in any way possible. Oil nationalization law led to a direct conflict between Mossadegh and the British government. So, Britain tried to regain its control over oil industry of Iran by following a three-track strategy aimed at either pressuring him into a favorable settlement or by removing him from the office. The three component of Britain's strategy was, I, legal maneuvers including refusing direct negotiation with Mossadegh, too, imposing economic sanctions on Iran accompanied by performing war games in the region and three, removal of Mossadegh through covert political action. Topic. Aftermath The coup has been said to have left a profound and long-lasting legacy. Topic blowback According to the history based on documents released to the National Security Archive and reflected in the book Mohammad Mossadegh and the 1953 coup in Iran, the coup caused long-lasting damage to the U.S. reputation. The 28 Mordad coup, as it is known by its Persian date in the Solar Hijri calendar, was a watershed for Iran, for the Middle East and for the standing of the United States in the region. The joint U.S.-British operation ended Iran's drive to assert sovereign control over its own resources and helped put an end to a vibrant chapter in the history of the country's nationalist and democratic movements. These consequences resonated with dramatic effect in later years. When the Shah finally fell in 1979, memories of the U.S. intervention in 1953, which made possible the monarch's subsequent, and increasingly unpopular, 25-year reign intensified the anti-American character of the revolution in the minds of many Iranians. The authoritarian monarch appreciated the coup, Kermit Roosevelt wrote in his account of the affair. I owe my throne to God, my people, my army and to you, by you he the Shah meant me and the two countries, Great Britain and the United States, I was representing. 
We Were All Heroes. On 16 June 2000, The New York Times published the secret CIA report, Clandestine Service History, Overthrow of Premier Mossadegh of Iran, November 1952 – August 1953, partly explaining the coup from CIA agent Wilbur's perspective. In a related story, the New York Times reporter James Risen penned a story revealing that Wilbur's report, hidden for nearly five decades, had recently come to light. In the summer of 2001, Irvand Abrahamian writes in the journal Science and Society that Wilbur's version of the coup was missing key information some of which was available elsewhere. The New York Times recently leaked a CIA report on the 1953 American-British overthrow of Mossadegh, Iran's prime minister. It billed the report as a secret history of the secret coup, and treated it as an invaluable substitute for the U.S. files that remain inaccessible. But a reconstruction of the coup from other sources, especially from the archives of the British Foreign Office, indicates that this report is highly sanitized. It glosses over such sensitive issues as the crucial participation of the U.S. ambassador in the actual overthrow, the role of U.S. military advisors, the harnessing of local Nazis and Muslim terrorists, and the use of assassinations to destabilize the government. What is more, it places the coup in the context of the Cold War rather than that of the Anglo-Iranian oil crisis, a classic case of nationalism clashing with imperialism in the Third World. In a review of Tim Weiner's Legacy of Ashes, historian Michael Beschloss wrote, Mr. Weiner argues that a bad CIA track record has encouraged many of our gravest contemporary problems. A generation of Iranians grew up knowing that the CIA had installed the Shah. Mr. Weiner notes, In time, the chaos that the agency had created in the streets of Tehran would return to haunt the United States. The administration of Dwight D. Eisenhower considered the coup a success, but, given its blowback, that opinion is no longer generally held, because of its haunting and terrible legacy. In 2000, Madeleine Albright, U.S. Secretary of State, said that intervention by the U.S. in the internal affairs of Iran was a setback for democratic government. The coup is widely believed to have significantly contributed to the 1979 Iranian Revolution, which deposed the pro-Western Shah and replaced the monarchy with an anti-Western Islamic Republic. For many Iranians, the coup demonstrated duplicity by the United States, which presented itself as a defender of freedom but did not hesitate to use underhanded methods to overthrow a democratically elected government to suit its own economic and strategic interests. The agents France Press reported, United States Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas, who visited Iran both before and after the coup, wrote that when Mossadegh and Persia started basic reforms, we became alarmed. We united with the British to destroy him, we succeeded, and ever since, our name has not been an honored one in the Middle East. Iran When the Shah returned to Iran after the coup, he was greeted by a cheering crowd. He wrote in his memoirs that while he had been a king for over a decade, for the first time he felt that the people had elected and approved of him, and that he had a legitimate popular mandate in order to carry out his reforms although some in the crowd may have been bribed. The Shah however, never was able to remove the reputation of being a foreign imposed ruler among non-royalist Iranians. However the Shah throughout his rule continued to assume that he was supported by virtually everybody in Iran, and sank into deep dejection when in 1978 massive mobs demanded his ousting. 
The incident left him in awe of American power, while it also gave him a deep hatred of the British. When the Shah attempted during the 1970s to once again control the oil prices through OPEC, and cancel the same oil consortium agreement that caused the 1953 coup, it resulted in a massive decline in U.S. support for the Shah, and ironically, hastened his downfall. An immediate consequence of the coup d'état was the suppression of all republicanist political dissent, especially the liberal and nationalist opposition umbrella group National Front as well as the Communist Today Party, and concentration of political power in the Shah and his courtiers, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the closest associate of Mossadegh, Hossein Fatemi, was executed by order of the Shah's military court by firing squad on 10 November 1954. According to Kinzer, the triumphant Shah Pahlavi ordered the execution of several dozen military officers and student leaders who had been closely associated with Mohammad Mossadegh. As part of the post-coup d'état political repression between 1953 and 1958, the Shah outlawed the National Front and arrested most of its leaders. The Shah personally spared Mossadegh the death penalty, and he was given three years in prison, followed by house arrest for life. Many supporters of Iran continued to fight against the new regime, yet they were suppressed with some even being killed. The political party that Mossadegh founded, the National Front of Iran, was later reorganized by Karim Sanjabi, and is currently being led by the national poet of Iran Adib Bohramand, who was a strong Mossadegh supporter and helped spread pro-Mossadegh propaganda during the Abadan crisis and its aftermath. The communist today, however, bore the main brunt of the crackdown. The Shah's security forces arrested 4,121 two-day political activists including 386 civil servants, 201 college students, 165 teachers, 125 skilled workers, 80 textile workers, and 60 cobblers. Forty were executed primarily for murder, such as Khosrau Ruzba, another 14 died under torture and over 200 were sentenced to life imprisonment. The Shah's post-coup dragnet also captured 477 two-day members. 22 colonels, 69 majors, 100 captains, 193 lieutenants, 19 noncommissioned officers, and 63 military cadets, who were in the Iranian armed forces. After their presence was revealed, some National Front supporters complained that this communist two-day military network could have saved Mossadegh. However, few two-day officers commanded powerful field units, especially tank divisions that might have countered the coup. Most of the captured two-day officers came from the military academies, police and medical corps. At least 11 of the captured army officers were tortured to death between 1953 and 1958. Nevertheless, the Shah's response was exceedingly mild compared to the typical reaction that the future Islamic Republic would usually give to its opponents, or even other contemporary autocracies. After the 1953 coup, the Shah's government formed the Savak secret police, many of whose agents were trained in the United States. The Savak monitored dissidents, and carried out censorship. After the 1971 Siakal incident, it was given a loose leash to torture suspected dissidents with brute force that, over the years, increased dramatically, and nearly 100 people were executed for political reasons during the last 20 years of the Shah's rule. Nevertheless, the Shah generally dealt with dissent in a relatively mild manner compared to most autocratic leaders. After the revolution, Savak was officially abolished, but was in reality, drastically expanded, 
into a new organization that killed over 8,000 to 12,000 prisoners between 1981 to 1985 alone, and 20,000 to 30,000 in total, with one prisoner who served time under both the Shah and the Islamic Republic declaring that Four months under Islamic Republics, Warden Asadallah Layavardi took the toll of four years under Savak. Another effect was sharp improvement of Iran's economy. The British led oil embargo against Iran ended, and oil revenue increased significantly beyond the pre nationalization level. Despite Iran not controlling its national oil, the Shah agreed to replacing the Anglo-Iranian oil company with a consortium—British Petroleum and eight European and American oil companies. In result, oil revenues increased from $34 million in 1954–1955 to $181 million in 1956–1957, and continued increasing, and the United States sent development aid and advisors. The Shah's government attempted to solve the issue of oil nationalization through this method, and Iran began to develop rapidly under his rule. The Shah later in his memoirs declared that Mossadegh was a dictator that was damaging Iran through his stubbornness, while he the Shah followed the smarter option. By the 1970s, Iran was wealthier than all of its surrounding neighbors, and economists frequently predicted that it would become a major global economic power, and a developed country. Internationally Kinzer wrote that the 1953 coup d'état was the first time the United States used the CIA to overthrow a democratically elected, civil government. The Eisenhower administration viewed Operation Ajax as a success, with immediate and far-reaching effect. Overnight, the CIA became a central part of the American foreign policy apparatus, and covert action came to be regarded as a cheap and effective way to shape the course of world events. A coup engineered by the CIA called Operation PBS UCCESS toppling the duly elected Guatemalan government of Jacobo Arbenz Guzman, which had nationalized farm land owned by the United Fruit Company, followed the next year. A pro American government in Iran doubled the United States' geographic and strategic advantage in the Middle East, as Turkey, also bordering the USSR, was part of NATO. In 2000, U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine K. Albright, acknowledged the coup's pivotal role in the troubled relationship and "...came closer to apologizing than any American official ever has before." The Eisenhower administration believed its actions were justified for strategic reasons. But the coup was clearly a setback for Iran's political development. And it is easy to see now why many Iranians continue to resent this intervention by America in their internal affairs. In June 2009, the U.S. President Barack Obama in a speech in Cairo, Egypt, talked about the United States' relationship with Iran, mentioning the role of the U.S. in 1953 Iranian coup saying, this issue has been a source of tension between the United States and the Islamic Republic of Iran. For many years, Iran has defined itself in part by its opposition to my country, and there is indeed a tumultuous history between us. In the middle of the Cold War, the United States played a role in the overthrow of a democratically elected Iranian government. Since the Islamic Revolution, Iran has played a role in acts of hostage-taking and violence against U.S. troops and civilians. This history is well known. Rather than remain trapped in the past, I have made it clear to Iran's leaders and people that my country is prepared to move forward. <laughs> 
Topic: Legacy. In the Islamic Republic, remembrance of the coup is quite different from that of history books published in the West, and follows the precepts of Ayatollah Khomeini that Islamic jurists must guide the country to prevent the influence of foreign powers. Kashani came out against Mossadegh by mid-1953 and told a foreign correspondent that Mossadegh had fallen because he had forgotten that the Shah enjoyed extensive popular support." A month later, Kashani, "...went even further and declared that Mossadegh deserved to be executed because he had committed the ultimate offense, rebelling against the Shah, betraying the country, and repeatedly violating the sacred law." Men associated with Mossadegh and his ideals dominated Iran's first post-revolutionary government. The first prime minister after the Iranian Revolution was Mehdi Bazargan, a close associate of Mossadegh. But with the subsequent rift between the conservative Islamic establishment and the secular liberal forces, Mossadegh's work and legacy has been largely ignored by the Islamic Republic establishment. However, Mossadegh remains a popular historical figure among Iranian opposition factions. Mossadegh's image is one of the symbols of Iran's opposition movement, also known as the Green Movement. Kinzer writes that Mossadegh, for most Iranians, is the most vivid symbol of Iran's long struggle for democracy and that modern protesters carrying a picture of Mossadegh as the equivalent of saying, we want democracy, and no foreign intervention. In the Islamic Republic of Iran, Kinzer's book All the Shah's Men, An American Coup and the Roots of Middle East Terror has been censored of descriptions of Ayatollah Abol Ghassem Kashani's activities during the Anglo-American coup d'état. Mahmoud Kashani, the son of Abol Ghassem Kashani, one of the top members of the current, ruling elite, whom the Iranian Council of Guardians has twice approved to run for the presidency, denies there was a coup d'état in 1953, saying Mossadegh was obeying British plans to undermine the role of Shia clerics. This allegation also is posited in the book Katarat e Arteshbid e Bazneshta Hossein Fardaust, the memoirs of retired General Hossein Fardaust, published in the Islamic Republic and allegedly written by Hossein. Hossein Fardaust, a former Savik officer. It says that rather than being a mortal enemy of the British, Mohammad Mossadegh always favoured them, and his nationalisation campaign of the Anglo-Iranian oil company was inspired by the British themselves. Scholar Irvand Abrahamian suggests that the fact that Fardust's death was announced before publication of the book may be significant, as the Islamic Republic authorities may have forced him into writing such statements under duress. Topic viewpoints Ruhala Khomeini said the government didn't pay enough attention to religious figures which caused the coup d'état to take place and described the separation between religion and politics as a fault in contemporary history. Ali Khamenei believed that Mossadegh trusted the United States and asked them to help confront Britain. As a result, the 1953 coup d'état was executed by the U.S. against Mossadegh. Barack Obama, the previous president of the United States, said in regard to the role of the U.S. in the 1953 Iranian coup d'état that may be well known, but it is not well founded. He also stated that the United States played a major role in the overthrow of a democratically elected prime minister. In a tweet sent by Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif on 19 August 2018, the U.S. overthrew the popularly elected democratic government of Dr. Mossadegh, restoring the dictatorship and subjugating Iranians for the next 25 years with the 1953 coup. Topic. In popular culture 
directed by Hassan Fathi and written jointly with playwright and university professor Nagma Samina, Sharzad TV show is the story of a love broken apart by events in the aftermath of the 1953 coup that overthrew the democratically elected Prime Minister, Mohamed Mossadegh. Cognito Comics, Verso Books has published a non-fiction graphic novel of the history, Operation Ajax, the story of the CIA coup that remade the Middle East, that covers events leading to how the CIA hired rival mobs to create anarchy and overthrow the country. See also Iranian Revolution, the Islamist Revolution, which occurred 25 years later, deposing the Shah. 1957 alleged Jordanian military coup attempt 1981 Bahraini coup d'état attempt CIA activities in Iran Iran crisis of 1946 List of modern conflicts in the Middle East Special Activities Division <laughs>